We've all heard of the Chevrolet Corvette being heralded as America's sports car, but to me, next to a Corvette and even next to a Ford GT, I think the most amazing and coolest sports car ever to come out of the US is the Dodge Viper. And over the last five years from this very chair, we have had some amazing Dodge Viper stories of the cars and their owners. So today, we've compiled our top 10 Viper stories for you to enjoy as one big video. So sit back, relax, and enjoy some amazing Dodge Viper content. But I hope that you'll also check out today's sponsor, Surfshark VPN. Surfshark can protect and empower your internet experience no matter where you're at on the globe. If you're a US-based person traveling internationally and you're trying to access content that's geofenced or restricted, Surfshark VPN can help with that. Similarly, if you're in the US trying to access international content that we're not easily able to find, Surfshark can help with that as well. And Surfshark VPN is also a very powerful way to protect yourself online and manage who has access to your personal data and information. So check them out now, either using this QR code or the link in the description below to empower your internet experience using Surfshark. Not only will you get three months free, but you'll also get an 83% discount on their two-year plan along with their 30-day money-back guarantee. So nothing to lose, please do check them out to protect yourself, empower your internet browsing no matter where you're at, and thank them for their support of VinWiki. Check out Surfshark VPN and enjoy today's Viper Stories. I put the clutch in, put put the brake on, I just sit there and I'm like, are, are we good? Up until this point of me being 32 years old, I had never paid more than $4,000 for a car, but I had owned 60 vehicles. Most of them were these $300 cars that I was actually buying from Pennsylvania. When I was in college in Georgia, buying these $300 cars in Pennsylvania that could not get inspected because they were deemed unsafe, and I was driving them to Georgia and you know, for really, really cheap. So I had never spent any more than $4,000 on a car, which is pretty much the exact opposite of what Ed does. So I was watching a VinWiki video, and it was about Casey talking about how much he loved his uh, 96 Gen 2 GTS Coupe Dodge Viper. And at this point, you know, business is doing pretty well, and my two YouTube channels are doing pretty good. And I'm thinking, okay, I, I can afford this. So I talked to my uh, financial advisor, and I'm like, is this crazy? I'm thinking about buying a, a Dodge Viper, and I'm going to make some videos with it. I'm going to enjoy it, but then I'll, I'll sell it, and, you know, if I, if I make a couple bucks, break even, or even lose a couple bucks... That'll be fine. It'll it'll be some good hype for the for the YouTube channel. I, I watched Casey's videos. He's just talking about how awesome this car is and how they they're going up in value and how how beautiful they are and how like it was one of his dream cars when he was a kid and it was one, it was one of my dream cars too. You know, I had the poster on my wall and and how they're pretty easy to fix. You know, Jay Leno says you can fix them with a hammer, and you know it's it's still a Dodge and probably most places can fix it. It's all these cool things and I'm like, man, that's that's exactly what I want. This that's a cool car. I can I can get it. And he's they also mentioned how you can get them for like between like thirty and fifty thousand dollars. That's a pretty good bang for your buck. Especially for a car that's, you know, going up in value. You know, you can buy a brand new Honda Accord for probably more than what I paid for the for this Dodge Viper, but it's only going down in value. You could buy an old Dodge Viper and it's potentially going up. So I'm looking around for a Dodge Viper and I start, I realize, okay, I want, I want the 96. That's the year everyone wants and I, I want low miles. I, of course, I want the blue and white stripes and I find one in New Hampshire. And it was the, the daughter of the guy who owned it was selling it because he passed away. He passed away a couple years ago, so sat in her garage for a couple years. And the, the local uh, Viper Club of New Hampshire, uh, owner, the guy who like managed or owned the Viper Club, he would come by and he would start it up and he would drive it around a little bit, just make sure, you know, everything was running and wasn't just rotting out. They were asking 45 for it. And I did some, what they call shrewd negotiating. And I tried to get it for 30 and we went back and forth. And something that I realized from buying, you know, hundreds of motorcycles and, and a lot of cars is that one of the most important things about negotiating is building a rapport with someone. You know, showing them that you're not just some jerk throwing out some horrible jerk number, that you're you're a nice guy. And I, you know, I, I sent her a link to my YouTube channel just to make her feel a little safer. Like, hey, this is me. I'm I'm this guy on on the videos. You know, what I mean, I'm a regular guy. And people are more likely to give their friend a good deal because they know him or someone that they think is nice than someone who they don't like and they think is being rude, just offering you know low ball offers. Uh, we agreed on $36,000 for this Dodge Viper. It's middle of winter. 
I grab my brother, I grab my van, I grab my trailer. We start driving up to New Hampshire. If anyone knows anything about New Hampshire, it's always snowing in New Hampshire. So we go up there, it's about a 10 hour drive and it's getting, it's getting, it's looking really bad. It's actually snowing at the point that we show up there. And it's a really, really narrow driveway. It's a one lane road that goes to multiple houses. So I pull up, I kind of finagle my van in a way that I think I might be able to pull the car up onto it. At this point, I'm blocking the entire street. We do the deal, everything looks good. Uh, the Viper looks good. I've never driven a Viper before because no one's gonna let me drive their Viper. I pay her the money and I, I get the title and I, I back the car up down the driveway. Now we're, we're at this point, it's fr it's like freezing rain and we're about, about two inches of snow on the ground. I'm backing this thing up and I'm lining it up with my trailer. Well, I've got a, a buggy trailer and the ramps look about like this and they instantly were touching the bottom of the Viper. I, I didn't know how the Dodge Viper sits like this far off the ground. So I, I had I had planned for this. I had some motorcycle ramps that I use that I was gonna take apart. They're about eight feet long and I was gonna put them on both, both sides to kind of step up, step up the ramp. It's kind of sketchy, but what are you gonna do? And I'm horrified. This is more money than I've ever paid for any car times 10 in my lifetime. And I'm gonna attempt to load this thing up with my brother in snow while it's freezing rain with no help. And, and, and f knowing full well that if this doesn't work out, if this thing falls off the trailer or something, I'm, there's no one's gonna help me out. You know what I mean? I'm done. I, I, I will have ruined the car. I don't know what I'm gonna do. The Dodge Vipers are pretty torquey. I think they're rated like 490 foot pounds of torque, you know, from brand new. I actually had my dyno at 406 horsepower, 460 foot pounds of torque to the wheels. And I didn't use the gas. I'm just easing off the clutch. It's rolling up there. It's going up. It's, it's almost touch. It's almost touching the front bumper, but it, it clears it. And then we get up. Keep in mind, these are 335 tires. These are giant tires. At the, at the time, the Viper had the largest tires of any production car ever. I finally get off the ramps and onto the part of my trailer that's dovetail. Most of my trailer is wood. The dovetail part is diamond plate. And it's been raining, it's been like snowing and then raining and then snowing a little bit. As soon as I touch the diamond plate, my tire starts to spin and the whole Viper kicks over about eight inches. I put the clutch in, put, put the brake on, I just sit there and I'm like, are, are we good? Are we okay? What's going on back there? I have no clue. He tells me that, I thought I was still on the ramp actually. I, I, in, in my mind, I'm thinking, all right, that, that big old tire's hanging basically completely off the ramp. I just shifted it over on the dovetail. We were good. The trailer's wide enough. We had enough room. I ended up driving the thing on and we strapped it down. We're soaked. The Viper was preserved. Nothing got damaged. We strapped it down, drove it the 12 hours home. That's how I got my Dodge Viper. I, I love the Viper. Um, it was a blast. It was a blast to drive. One of the coolest things about the Viper is you get, you get tons of looks in this thing. Now, when you're driving a when you're driving a Corvette or something else, everyone's got a Corvette. It's no big deal. When you're driving a Viper, you know you're, you're driving down. You got guys, you know, giving you thumbs up, and you know people are stopping you about it. And I mean, because the Viper, the the style really hasn't changed that much. You know, you, you can tell a Viper from, you know, all the Vipers. They still look like a Viper. No one really knows what year it is. I had a great time driving it. It was it was just a lot of fun. It was just fun owning a fun fun car to own. It's been very cheap. Uh, very cheap and very, it's actually been a very reliable car. So, to make a long story short, KC was right. Dodge Viper, second gen Dodge Vipers are awesome. I have decided to sell it, mainly because I've, I opened up that door where you buy more expensive cars. And then since the Viper, I bought a Ariel Atom 2, I bought a 2010 Grand Sport Corvette that's been supercharged, that we just had dyno today, is pushing 630 horsepower I've, and I've got a bunch of other cars that, that that's kind of one of the reason the Viper felt super fast when I first got it compared to my Corvette it does not feel fast at all compared to the Atom it feels like it's standing still but when all said and done it's it's too nice too nice of a car for me if anything gets scratched on it I gotta be the guy that I messed up that Viper you know what I mean I messed up you know there's not that many clean they're, they're out there but they're a lot, a lot of Vipers got totaled and a lot of Vipers have, you know, our titles on them. And the car is just way too clean for me. I would have much more fun in a salvage title Viper that I paid less money for, that I fixed it up and it had a wrap on it. And it's something I could really beat up. I would have more fun with that. Something this clean and, you know, when parts are getting a little more scarce and the paint is perfect on it. You know what I mean? I just, I'd rather let someone else, someone else enjoy it.
I could still tell it was still my car. Well, my blue with white stripes 1997 Dodge Viper is my favorite car. It's the one I've had the longest, I've got the most adventures and memories with, and the one that I will most likely keep forever. That was also my first story on Ben Wiki. It was the first one of mine that was well over a million and really got recognizable for that and has been a mainstay on my channel and I keep having adventures. And in that story, I talked about how that was my first wild exotic car when I lived in the small town of Tiffin, Ohio, and basically the thing that got me kicked out of town because I enjoyed it exuberantly on a daily basis on the roads surrounding the town. The general populace and some law enforcement didn't take as kindly to that, and I thought maybe I should go somewhere where my personality and this car will vibe a little bit better. The part of the story that really got glossed over a good bit was the car got wrecked. And it was to no fault of my own, but when I lived down in Columbus, Ohio, and I was in Dublin, it was a warm December day. There was, it was a dry road, everything was fine. I was just coming back from a Cars and Coffee and driving very normally and very legally and someone tried to blaze across five lanes of traffic where you were only legally allowed to turn right. I uh, couldn't avoid them, hit it, the car was totaled. Uh, just with everything going on in my life in the time, I really didn't have time to fix it. And insurance took it, and I didn't think that much of it. I was sad, uh, but I had the car for a while, I thought it's time for a new adventure, get something fresher. It's somewhat funny because I bought a C6 Corvette with a smaller portion of the money that I got from insurance. And I thought this is gonna be a little bit more everydayable. I can take the top off, it's a little bit more comfortable, the air conditioning works better, the stereo sounds a little better, it's gonna be great. And I thought it was good fun for a while and I went out and bought a Ducati motorcycle that I always wanted, the Mike Hale with MH900E and I felt pretty good. And the Corvette was going fine, but it's kinda like you have a moment in life, and I had it with this car on an on-ramp that I always enjoyed so much in the Dodge Viper because I'd hit first gear, second gear, and it would sound so amazing in the Dodge Viper and I'd be just spinning the tires all the way up to like 70 miles an hour and the exhaust would echo off the walls and the, the, the barriers and it was awesome. And I want to go do it in the Corvette. And it was the biggest letdown ever and that was the moment that I realized that Corvette for me was the quintessential rebound relationship. <laughs> this isn't the long term, this isn't gonna work, and it totally killed the Corvette for me because it would never be my Dodge Viper. And it was something like a year that had gone by, and after the car got wrecked, there were a number of parts the insurance company didn't care about that I just kept. I think I had like a subwoofer and some stereo stuff, maybe the wing off the car, and just a number of odds and ends. I had a personal steering wheel or Fittipaldi steering wheel, things like this that I, I just kept for the car and they laid around. I don't, I don't know what I kept them for. Maybe I was gonna sell them. Maybe I thought I was gonna buy a Viper in the future and being a pack rat, but I had them. And I still remember vividly, I got a phone call from a number I didn't recognize. But what happened was over the course of the last year, year and a half, the car went to auction, insurance auction. A guy up in Michigan bought it and he was starting to put it back together. Straighten the frame rails, fix the hood, put it all together. And my car still had a Putsch Racing sticker on it. And he saw that, started tracking it down, figured out it was my car, somehow find my number and called me. And he goes, I'm, I'm rebuilding this car. And I'm like, yeah, that's my old car. He goes, is there any chance you have any parts for it? And I'm like, yeah, actually I do. Which was hilarious, or maybe funnier later in the story, because he ended up buying parts off of me that I had. I might even had like floor mats and stuff. I didn't think anything up. So I sold these parts of the, the car to this guy and he was building it, stayed in touch a little bit, but I didn't think anything of it. It wasn't, not my car, it was gone. Maybe six months later, he calls me up again, and he goes, well, I got it done and I was enjoying it, but I think I'm gonna sell it. Do you have any interest in it? I'm like, maybe. But I, I moved on, like I'm, I'm trying to tell myself, like that chapter's come and gone. But I'm gonna go look at the car. So I go up into Michigan and it was pretty much like right in the winter, it was rather cold, and checked out the car. I sort of made a deal on the car. Like the guy sent me pictures, and I was no longer emotionally attached. It was like the relationship that went away. It's like, we're not getting back together. Nope, nope, I'm over you. I don't need this. You know, one of those kind of things. And so I, I really lowballed the guy. I remember going up there, I think briefly with my dad to check it out. Like we had a little bit of time. We just went to take a peek at the car. And I looked at it and the way that it was repaired was, it was like, okay, but it wasn't nice. 
It was the way you would if you wanted to get a car done quickly and make a good car that was drivable, but you weren't trying to make it overly perfect, but you also get excited and want to throw a bunch of money at even more ridiculous parts for it. So the car had way overly harsh, ridiculous low lowering springs on it. It had later all black Viper wheels on it that were larger with thinner profile tires and invented uh, brake rotors and such. So it just, it, it drove like a car with no shocks on Michigan roads. It was kind of horrible in that way. and felt like it was going to fall apart because of it. Also, the old wing was gone and the guy put on the Hennessy wing, which looks like a Toyota Supra, which is a rare part. You can't get them anymore. And it's kind of cool looking back from 90s nostalgia, but when I saw it on my car, I'm like, this, this looks kind of dumb. And it no longer had the cool Daytona nose with the splitter because that got destroyed in the wreck. So I had a stock nose. And it was still my car, but it didn't feel right. And he also got rid of the stock black seats and put in what were kind of cool. They were one company made or redid Viper seats with blue leather and a white stripe, which to me is kind of what the baby boomer generation likes to do when they get really excited about a hot rod. They want to paint the whole interior to match the exterior color of a car. And they may love that, but I really don't at all. So that's the way my Viper was. It even had a blue shift knob with the white stripes. Like you took the white stripes thing way too far. I test drive the car and I did it on my own. My dad stayed there and that was a, a bit of a moment because I could still tell it was still my car. And it was kind of like if you've ever been in a relationship and then you kind of came back and had a little fun. It's like, whoa, we just had laughs. I remember why I fell in love with this car or person in the first place. It's like, but this isn't the same thing, you know? And I brought it back and I was, I was interested in it, but I was kind of divorced. It also had like ridiculous tinted windows and it was, it had tinted tail lights, so they don't work, you know? And all of these things going on, but you could hear a distinct tick in the engine, which was not a little tick. And I'm listening to this, I'm like, this is valve train, but this is also gonna take a lot of hours and a little bit of money. And I'm, I'm not, this isn't a little thing. And that tick wasn't there when I had it. So I'm thinking, what would happen to this poor thing in the meantime? But it was, drove well, it was, it was relatively straight and everything was fixed pretty well. The paint match was okay and all. So I drove away and as my dad was, because he just hates all projects, or I don't know if he goes into the dad thing, thinking that even though I can build a car from nothing, I'm still a son and I think he thinks I'm still an eight year old kid and he's gonna have to do the work for me. But he's like, no, terrible car. And I was sleeping on it and I think there was, there was something else I was gonna buy and I was gonna be try to be more reasonable. But my wife, who I think was my fiance at the time, she said to me, that car's your baby, that car's you. That's the one you need to buy. And I was like, nah, I'm gonna be reasonable. And I called the guy, which is kind of nice because you're divorced from it. And I was able to more lowball him. My Viper gets wrecked. It was pretty cherry. And then it was gone for a few years. And I got, I think like $43,000 from the insurance company. And then a few years later, I bought back my same car running and driving, but configured differently with all these parts for like $25,000. So even though I got to fix engine things, I've, I've got a lot of room to work with. I mean, I got so much room to work with, I don't care at this point. So I got it back and I was happy. It felt good, but the car needed love. It had all kinds of issues. It wasn't right. It was, it, it, your, your fillings would fall out of your teeth. It had the worst suspension in the world on over any bumps. So I'm gonna start working on it. And at that time, I was getting into the first year of Genius Garage. So I was spending so much time with that and putting my own resources into it. I wasn't making any money. Like, it was rough. The car went back home to my condo. Like so many young people, I'm renting a condo in this little two car garage. And that's where the Omega car sat for many years before I decided to work on it again and drive it. But I narrowed it down. I took the valve covers off and I started looking down, it was lifters. And with the Viper engine being a big push rod V10, much like if anybody's working on a small block Ford or Chevy, you can take the valve covers off, you can take the rockers, you can pull out the push rods, except the Dodge Viper has one really stupid feature stuck. Unlike a small block, Chevy or Ford. The head gaskets have so much extra material that they cover the holes where the lifters are. So it's impossible to just take the lifters out from the valley with the stock head gaskets in place. So then my kind of cheap but clever idea, I'm like, well, what if I just cut the excess trim of the head gaskets off? It won't actually matter. And I devised started making a sharp tool to do it. That didn't work and I stopped immediately. <laughs> but the process of the Viper at this point kind of became a longer thing. I was gonna take my time and do it right because I decided I'm gonna keep this car forever and I want it to be right, it's a labor of love. But it was also sort of resurrecting the memories, but it was almost became more personal. The car had a personality, it was almost had a soul at this point. And I sort of had to bring this soul back from the dead in a way. And as silly as it seems, the car 
was sort of dark when it came back. It had a personality. The personality before was very bright and vibrant and over the top and exciting when I had it, as I imagine a lot of people will make fun of my personality for being. But when the car came back from being wrecked, it was almost like an old Greek sort of story, like it came back from the river Styx from the dead, and now it has these black wheels and like black tinted headlights and windows and this wing and it rides harsh and it's like it came straight from hell. And it sort of did coming back from that. So in resurrecting it and fixing it, I'm taking apart the engine in my condo. Heads are coming off. I'm pulling the radiator out so I can pull the long V10 camshaft out of the front. I'm thinking, okay, I'll have the heads rebuilt, as you do. So I took it to my engine builder, but the greatest thing when I went to pick it up, he's like, Casey, I'm charging you 40 bucks for cleaning them up. I, I decked them, they're perfectly straight. The valves are fine. I, I, could, I could work on it, but there's really no point. Just get some head gas and put it back on. But it was something that I kept for myself. I didn't do it at the shop and I didn't rush it and do it in a business-like way because I wanted to enjoy it. I wanted to have the personal attachment of bringing it back to life. For a lot of people that have wondered why do I have the license plate Odysseus on the car, um, is because I was thinking of the meanings back when. Because my first license plate on the car was Enzo Who, because I was a cocky punk and I thought it was fun to beat up on <laughs> guys with Ferraris at the time. But in thinking about it again, I saw so many things from the story of the car and my own life and picking myself you know, up and moving that just related to the Odyssey, that that ended up sticking and kind of was adding so much more meaning to the tale. But that, that is the story of the Viper going to hell and coming all the way back, getting rebuilt and coming back to life forevermore. I built this car to Lambo hunt. Yeah, I've always been obsessed with fast cars. I've always been big on horsepower. And from the day I got my driver's license, I mean, pulling out of the high school sideways in my 89 Camaro and getting a reckless driving ticket, the cop that pulled me over, he said, do you want a speeding ticket or a reckless driving ticket? And me being the idiot 16 year old kid that I was, I literally said, why don't you give me both? Like I was completely ignorant to how serious a reckless driving ticket was. That was the beginning of my rambunctious phase of life where street racing was a big part of my life. As time evolved, cars got faster. Back in 2002, I bought a C5 Corvette. It's a 99 FRC. That car is still part of my soul. Every spare dollar I had went into that car to make it fast. And it was unheard of back then to have a thousand horsepower car on the street that was usable and reliable. I had mimicked somebody's build up in the Northeast and I had this supercharged Paxton Novi 2000 kit on my C5 Corvette. I used like 850 wheel. Thing was a rocket ship. All of these years, I had been going out to the street races in Oklahoma City, and this was pre-Street Outlaws, Big Chief, Farm Truck, Asian. All of us were just street racers. It wasn't TV show and fame and all this stuff. We were just guys from Oklahoma. Now, I had different tastes than them. They liked the old muscle cars, and I liked exotic cars. I couldn't afford exotic cars. Certainly couldn't make an exotic car fast back then. So I had a Corvette that was the best thing I could afford. I'd pull up into the Sonic where we'd meet up to race. I'd get daddy's money, comments, all kinds of stuff, just beating me up all the time. They didn't like me. And so it, it drove me to make my car faster. So I was dating my girlfriend at the time. She went out there with me all the time. And we'd race guy after guy after guy. I mean, Daddy Dave, Dave Comstock, farm truck, Asian in his Chevy 2. The Black Crow, Big Chief, back when it was, you know, an 11-second car. I was racing all these guys, and I was winning. And they were starting to hate me more and more. This punk kid from Edmond, you know, Edmond's a... A bad word back then is where all the, the rich kids lived. I was called daddy money. That's all they, because they all assumed that my daddy was buying my cars. And they didn't know I was working 80 hours a week to pay for this stupid thing. Racking up credit cards and all that stuff. I mowed through everybody and was beating everybody. It was a, an incredible experience. And finally raced, at the time, the fastest car on the street. It was farm truck. It was a several-month buildup. 
And in my six-speed manual Corvette, I jumped him on the line and just stayed there. And after that night, all those guys became friends. And so I look back on that. It's a really special time, even though we were doing illegal things. It was a really special time in my car life to look back on, you know, and then seeing the great success those guys have had in their passions. You know, number one TV show on Discovery Channel for all these years. Like, it's really neat. I still, you know, we don't, I don't talk to those guys as much anymore, but when I see them, it's like old times and, you know, we catch up. But that evolved rapidly for me. They went the eighth mile route. I went the one mile route. The beautiful thing about the airstrip is I used to like to street race and I like to roll race. It's, you know, my favorite thing to do was run into a guy randomly on the street in my 800 horsepower Corvette and he's got his girlfriend in the car, some new, you know, the C6 Z06 or something that just came out to rock it and just embarrassing him. So whenever these airstrip events started happening, it really mimicked that. But the good thing is you're racing the fastest guys in the country. And so my Corvette went by the wayside. It just, a thousand horsepower on those things was at its limit. Rear ends, transmissions breaking all the time. Motors couldn't stay together. So I had to go to something with bigger displacement. So I bought a Viper. And then I realized if I'm going to compete with the big guys, the underground racings of the world, I need to go to an automatic because I was just blowing through transmissions left and right, making 1,350, 1,400 foot pounds of torque. Ended up buying a previous underground racing Viper because they started out building Mustangs, then with the Vipers, they were huge in the Vipers, great success, seven second quarter mile cars. This is back in 07, 08, 09 when they were building those. I bought a retired race car from them and uh, I bought it with the idea that it was a seven second car. Well, I, when I got it, it was far from that. It couldn't run much faster than nines because it was like it was detuned. Don't really know. It wasn't their fault. It was the, the the guy I bought it from. He had just made it more of a street car. And over the span of like two or three years, we re-engineered everything, redid the motor, put an updated ECU on it. It had an old AEM version one, put a MoTeC on it. And as soon as I got it in the right hands, at the time it was D3 Performance. They've changed their name now. Once I got it in the right hands, and the, the motor in the right hands, and the tuning in the right hands, we had a car that could compete. 2012, I made it to the finals of the Texas Invitational. The Texas Invitational at the time was the biggest, fastest cars in the country. There were guys bringing their cars from the Middle East to race, GTRs and stuff like that. And so whenever I showed up, everybody kind of laughed. Like, you know, this, I remember specifically one of the Twin Turbo Gallardo owners laughing about me and my Viper. It was like a David and Goliath type scenario and uh the first year i showed up the car failed the guys that wired it didn't wire it correctly i sent it to the right guys then all of a sudden it's run right and uh it's making all the power and instantly get to the finals race an underground car i screw up it was a turbo 400 i went from first to third i skipped second gear i would have won the race still not over that in 2014 i went back i raced every year but I was always aiming towards underground racing. They had the fastest cars. They won every event. You know, people would talk about um, Lambo hunting. And I built this car to Lambo hunt. That's all I want to do in my twin turbo Viper is beat the fastest Lambos. I had a chip on my shoulder. And so I make it to the semifinals and I've got a picture. Me, Kevin from underground, I'm racing him in their fastest car, that the fastest car they had, white Giardo. And on the other side was Casey of Underground Racing, Kevin's brother, and an AMS, the Alpha Omega car. I don't know if you ever saw that or not, but it's still surreal to me that guy from Edmond, Oklahoma has got this Viper that's competing with shops that have endless resources. I ended up beating Kevin. I was so emotionally drained to get there. Like whenever I had pulled into the pits, he came over with class said, good job. I couldn't even look up at him because I was, I still had my helmet on, face mask down because I was literally, and my whole body was shaking, crying so heavily. The emotional drain, the financial drain was unbelievable. You know, to keep that car running, it was, I was spending 60 to $80,000 a year. And that was to go to like five or six races. It's not like I was going every weekend. And the problem too, I was working. So like, I didn't have, one, I'm a terrible mechanic. I don't want to be a mechanic. I want to pay somebody to do it because I'd been working on lawnmowers my whole life. Last thing I want to do is 
going from working on my lawnmower to work on my race car. And I didn't know what I was doing anyway. So I had to pay somebody to keep it alive. It sucked because the car was never home. It was always in Houston because we'd go from one race, something would break, head gasket would blow, a motor would let go, a transmission would let go. And to keep it at that level, I don't think people realize what it takes to race at that level, how expensive it is, how dedicated you have to be, and how fast money can just disintegrate. You know, I had probably four to $500,000 wrapped up in that car in a you know four or five year span. One might ask, how do I end up spending $500,000 in a twin turbo Viper? You get acclimated to it. So, you know, I'd spent that Corvette I had street race for years. I probably had $100,000 in it, but it was a span over five years. You know, I bought the car for 28,000 bucks. It was a $740 car payment. So it's not like I was paying cash for this stuff. Back then I was cutting grass only. It says revenueing a thousand bucks a day and I'd pay my guys three or 400 bucks and I'd keep three or 400 bucks after, you know. So you just save and it, it has to be like your thing. This was my lifestyle. I lived in a old house next to a university that had next to no house payment. Every dollar I made went to that Viper. And if I didn't have the dollar, the credit card got swiped. And then you just figure out how to keep the credit card balance down low enough to keep your business flowing. So there was a sacrifice. And then you'd get the Viper paid down halfway and go refinance it so you could afford the racing for the next year. So, you know, it, it was almost kind of a drug to, that you had to keep feeding the beast and you were addicted to it. The license plate is hard work. That's what I put on that Viper. I got tired of people calling it daddy's money. Looking back on it, I was like, gosh, at the time I wanted a Ventador so bad. I was like, I could have paid cash and then some for an Aventador in this stupid race car. But I'll say the fraternity that you create at that level of racing, now I can still go to those races. That's a chapter that's behind me once I start having kids. And I don't miss it, but I look back fondly on those memories. It was such a great chapter of racing for me. It was so fun. I've never been more scared in my entire life in a motor vehicle. So with the release of Ford versus Ferrari, it shed a new light for younger eyes on the incredible Carroll Shelby. And I have a somewhat crazy story about Mr. Shelby. And I had no idea who this man was. Living in Indianapolis every year, they have the auto show in December, January-ish, and you can go look at the new latest models of the cars and what's coming out. Indianapolis has a tradition that they release what is going to be the upcoming pace car for the Indianapolis 500. And back through the 80s and, and even early 90s, it was not always a Corvette or not always a Camaro or not always a Chevrolet product. It would hand off between Ford and Dodge and, and Chevrolet and you Oldsmobile, the Pontiac Fiero was a pace car one year. You would always go to the auto show to find out what the next new pace car was and the mayor would drive it out and ah, it was a new pace car, whatever. So one year they released the new pace car as the all wheel drive Dodge Stealth, like this electric green, amazingly cool car. So they roll it out and the mayor gets out of it and there's the new pace car for this year. And the city lost its mind. The UAW flipped out and everything else because the Dodge Stealth is built overseas and it's rebranded as a Dodge when it's actually a Mitsubishi 3000 GT. We have no pace car now for this year's upcoming Indianapolis 500. And that was the year of the prototype Dodge Viper. And there weren't very many of them, and there were, I think, only two. So Dodge quickly grabbed the prototype Dodge Vipers, slapped some official pace car stickers on them, put a very ridiculous light bar on the roof or the back bar on the Viper, and now it is now rebranded as the official pace car of the Indianapolis 500. Uh, the stealths were 
you know, relegated to like parade cars or something terrible. I think those stills are now in the uh, Talladega Speedway Museum or just right outside it. I was disc jockeying at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway for an event during press day. And as you go through Gasoline Alley, there are, of course, garages all the way down, but there's a special garage for the pace car. And my event was just outside that garage and it was over. And I, this is, I'm probably DJing with cassettes at this point. Like it was, it was a long time ago. My friend that was there that had hired me to do this Miller Lite tent party or whatever it was, said, hey, you want to go see the pace car? And it had pulled out and pulled in and they were taking these press reporters and local newspaper people around the track and, and, and they wanted to show off the Dodge Viper because of all of the negative press that the Dodge Stealth had received. He pulled up and my parents graduated from Speedway High School, like Speedway is a town inside Indianapolis. So uh, the Motor Speedway has always been a big part of my life. And I'm like going, that's cool. I mean, it's a, it's a Cobra looking weird, but wow, what a car, right? The Viper of the 90s was off the rails. So this old timer pulls up in one of the pace cars. There were two of them that day and they were given rides around the track during press day. Somehow I received a ride. And so I got into the car and we pulled left and left and left onto the track. And you're going down pit lane at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And back then they didn't really have the blend lane that they do now. So you're basically on the track once you exit the pits. And when we exited the pits, old timer driving, you know, he's giving it the beans, like the beans. And coming out of turn one into the short chute and turn two and the sweets are on the right. And he looks at me and he was, you know, wants to, well, what do you do? You know, what, uh, he, he wants to know a little bit about myself. And I tell him, you know, I'm a disc jockey. I happen to be doing this tent party and laissez this, or, oh, it's, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I uh, said, so, well, let me tell you a little bit about this car. And he looks at me and hands off the wheel. And uh, there's a, this thing is the most stable, you know, car X, Y, Z and, and talking to me. And this car is incredible. It's the second coming and then Dodge has really put us, you know, just talking it up, hands off the wheel, looking at me, the stupid disc jockey in my twenties and telling me about how amazing this car is. And as we're approaching turn three down the back stretch at 160 or whatever miles an hour, he then decides to put his hands back on the wheel and take the turn into turn three through the short chute into four and then re-enters the pits and, you know, tells me that it was nice to meet me and have a good day and whatever else. And so we pull down the pits and then you turn left on the gasoline alley and then they were basically dumping me off and picking up another press guy, another somebody. My friend was there he says, how was that? And I said, this crazy old man was doing 160 miles an hour down the back stretch of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And he took his hands off the wheel and he looked at me and he wanted to tell me how he's doing and tell me about this car. And I've never been more scared in my entire life in a motor vehicle. And he goes, oh, that crazy old man's Carol Shelby. And I go, wow, okay. You never know you're in the presence of greatness sometimes until that moment's over. In all the crazy little stories and living in Indianapolis, Carol Shelby tried to kill me at 160 miles an hour with his hands off the wheel to express to me how amazing the new Dodge Viper was. I feel terrible because my Viper's been great and this one's being a cantankerous monster that's trying to kill itself. Well, my 97 blue with white stripes Dodge Viper has been an iconic car for me. And I've kept it for a long time. Bought that thing back in 2009, had 19,000 miles on it. Right now, right about 100,000 miles. And that was the one that actually goes back to my very first VinWiki story of the, what was it? The supercar that got me kicked out of my small town. With that car being the one that I, I guess made most known for and I put the most miles on it and I've enjoyed the most, it has that interesting story, kind of like the bird that flew away that came back. I've just always loved it. 
because if you need to cruise around in it slowly, you can. If you want to go fast, you can. There's no BS traction control or ABS. There's no cruise. There's just nothing in the way. It's just a raw, exciting car that makes cool noises and you can put it sideways at any time if you want. It's just been a really great companion to make memories in. But I'd always had uh, a fascination or just a little soft spot for those very early Dodge Vipers. The, the first ones, the RT10s, red, the three spoke weird wheels, side pipes, no proper windows, no proper top, no door handles on the outside. You gotta reach in if you have the top on or the side curtains, you unzip the window like a Jeep or a 1960s British car and you open it up and you get in. And I remember vividly, I think perhaps our dad took us maybe like the Henry Ford Museum where he us, or up in Detroit and uh, just doing car stuff and we're coming back, bored as kids are in car rides and being on I-75 in Michigan, I was sitting there and I don't remember if my dad looked in the mirror and mentioned or we saw it first, but we saw a red Viper on the highway, like in the wild, the first year. And it was a cold day. I don't remember the exact temperature. We had jackets on everything like that. And here comes a red Viper, no top, two guys in it just cruising up. And they were like super speeding, but they're coming up and they, they come to, to pass the, the car we're in, we're little kids. And I remember looking over and these two guys look like they came just straight off an Air Force flight line or something. Like, you know, leather jackets, hat, I don't, one guy probably had aviators on something, patches. And I'm just like, I don't necessarily know what cool is, but that's the coolest thing I've ever seen. It's like an 11, 12 year old kid. You're just like, yes. <laughs> And I remember that, you know, and you forget about it beyond that because my blue with white stripes Viper was always really usable. And the coupes in many ways are maybe a little prettier. It's um, a more usable, I don't want to say better car, but more usable in the real world. It's got windows that go up and down and door handles and locks. So it, it's suited it well. And I could never really justify, you know, I, I would never sell that to get an early one, but I always, always liked it. A few years back, when we moved to the Toledo area, I had worked at this small classic car dealership for a couple of years. And, you know, you look out for, you gotta have inventory, you gotta find cars to buy. And I think it was maybe Facebook Marketplace or Craigslist saw an early Viper for sale. It was built in 92, VIN number like 00030. And there's some funny things about Vipers where the VIN number doesn't necessarily reflect the exact time they came off in the production. It might be like when it was ordered, but it was kind of cool and I remembered that. I go check this out, this car out from the guy that owns it, just, you know, normal guy. Uh, it was this one cool car, had a little bit better exhaust. He'd done a couple things to it. Maybe had a couple glitches and car looked good. I don't think it was then, but he didn't want to come down to where I needed to be to buy it for the dealership for the nature of reselling it. I think he called me a few days or a week later and I just told him where I needed to be. And he said, yes, drove the car over, uh, made the deal for the dealership. And, and that was that. And of course, when a car comes in the dealership, you got to access it and see what's going on. And I, I think I drove it home one night. You know, the early ones, don't like sitting in traffic because of the way the fans come on. So they can tend to get a little hotter. They're a little more prone to blowing a head gasket. So just some things like that that are easy enough to work out. And of course they get a very bad rap from being too easy to wreck. And the simple truth is that they have a lot of torque and you can't be an idiot in it. You can't just stomp the throttle at any given time because you'll light up the tires and you better be ready for that kind of condition. Most people generally aren't and get a little more excited than their talent level can support in Viper. So that's, that's really where that bad rap comes from. And you know, in later days it comes from now the cars are vintage effectively. You can put historic plates on them. And the trouble is tires don't necessarily just crumble to dust. And there's people with Vipers like this with low miles that have 20 year old tires on. They're hard as a rock. And that's obviously setting you up for the same kind of scenario. Um, this car was good, but it just, Kind of the nature of the beast, but for the dealerships, so I have to go over the car. So took a couple little things to it. Sort of enjoyed that. Took a picture of the two cars together. That was kind of neat. Put it on the uh, showroom floor and represent it. And uh, a gentleman who was local to the area, uh, Dennis, I believe, came and checked it out and uh, knew his son, nice young man, actually helped the dealership a few times and he was really interested in it. Made a deal, he ended up buying it. And there was something in the back of my head like, this is the car I should buy but I, I couldn't buy it. It didn't have the space, it didn't have the, the means at the time or anything like that, but I, I remembered it. So it went away and every once in a while I would see them driving around. And the car was actually kind of a complete pain in my ass for a while because <laughs> we had sold it and suddenly like the fuel pump check valve went out. So it would lose all its fuel prime and then it would have to crank forever or you'd have to turn it on and off until it would prime and then start. And then the fuel pressure regulator went out and suddenly would skyrocket the fuel pressure to like 100 PSI and it was blowing out seals on the injectors and something else. And then after he bought it on its own, it sprung a fuel leak and caught on fire. 
It was just a little fire though. And fortunately the guy had a fire extinguisher on her and put it out <laughs> and it barely singed anything. And I'm just like, I'm in horrors because I, I sold him this car. It's as is, it's now a vintage car, but that's not what the kind of experience I want somebody to have. So I'm just, I feel terrible because my Viper has been great. And this one's being a cantankerous monster that's trying to kill itself. But they were very nice people and understand. They were car people, motorcycle people, and it was fine. But I was just like, oh my God. And so the son that had, and I think he was a teenager at the time when they bought it, late teenager, he would drive it. The dad would let him drive it. I'm like, I don't know if this is gonna end well. I don't know these people, but this does not seem like the kind of car that you let a teenager bomb around in. I didn't really think anything of it. A number of years later, I bump into every once in a while. I'd kind of say, hey, you still got my Viper? I mentioned to him, like, if you sold that, where would you be on it? And they weren't like trying to make a bunch of money or anything on that, just do it. And so I was kind of talking about it, but I didn't want to waste their time until I was really serious. But earlier this year, I started getting serious because obviously doing YouTube, I have a little more space and I'd sold a couple things. And I thought, you know, if I'm ever going to get one of these things, it probably better be now because they didn't make many of them. I mean, I think the first year of Viper production, what do they make like? 250 cars or something. So started talking with him and actually, uh, you know, over a little bit of time, I just wanted to kind of see where he was and money on it. And um, actually ended up making a nice deal on it. I, th I think I bought it for $31,000. Had 35,000 miles on it and they took amazing care of it. They changed the head gaskets and all. And, and the son who I was like, oh, I don't know how this is gonna go, took amazing care of it. So I think it goes to show that sort of taught me something. I complimented them both on it. And the dad, I'm like, you know, honestly, I didn't know it would be good, but your, your son took amazing care of this. I had actually financed part of it because I you know, wanted to make it happen, kind of add it to collection. I was excited. You know, it's kind of neat. I don't, I don't really want any other Vipers, but if I'm gonna have two, just two cars, it's pretty cool to have the Blue with White Stripes GTS and the early RT10. And so I was gonna, I said, well, I can, I can pay on Monday, something like that after work. And then we can get the car out. He's like, you know, you don't understand. It's, it's in storage in my brother's house. It's buried in the back of the warehouse on a lift with stuff under it. I'm like, all right, well, I can help you. Um, and he said, um, well, I said, maybe be around, he, we could do it on uh, Saturday. I'm like, all right. So it was a kind of an unseasonably beautiful day, um, like late winter, early spring this year and go over there early in the morning and uh, show up and it was, we just had a fun time and got to see some of the motorcycles and things they had that just were cool, kind of making friends. And the Viper was buried up on the lift under a cover. So we move all this stuff together and move some motorcycles out of the way and like uh, lawn care equipment and everything and get the car down. And there's a funny little thing those early Vipers do where they immobilize themselves and you have to have a little jumper wire and like ground out one little wire for just a second. It makes everything chill out. So I had to do that. And also I learned the joy of getting upside down and head first into the footwell of a Viper. Not actually very easily, but we go to get it out and uh, moving the cars around. I say, all right, well, where would you like to put it? And we'll meet up on Monday. And he said, you know what? You can just take it today if you want. And I'm not gonna jump on that because I don't want him to be uncomfortable in any way. And you know, we've made a deal. And I think part of the honor of buying a car is to not not expect anybody to do something they're uncomfortable with beyond the terms of it. It's like, I'm just helping you get stuff ready. You can buy it on Monday. I said, well, actually I already have insurance on it. And I'm like, do you wanna see? So I just emailed him my proof of insurance. And he's like, have fun. And I know it sounds like a little thing, but it was fun to kind of take a picture with the father and son. They enjoyed it. They had their fun. They were gonna go on to the next adventure. But I suddenly got the opportunity to bring literally a childhood dream that were the models. They were that early like vision you see in a dealership. The thing that sparks your lust as a car guy later on, but kind of that passing the torch, you know, cause they say you never really own a car. You just take care of it for the next owner or the next adventure. But it was a beautiful day and it was really exciting to hop in the car. I'd already known that car. I know they took care of it to just get in it and drive home. And my wife was home, it was a, it was a beautiful day. Uh, we had bought a fixer upper home the year before and it was starting to be less of a fixer upper, so it felt good. And my buddy Andrew, uh, from another story, he was along that day too, so I just go ripping home and the stereo works. And it was funny because I get on the highway and it's pretty cold and I've got my jacket and like glasses and everything on and it was a cold day on the highway, not much different than when I was a kid and I saw those two guys on the cold day on the highway in the same car when I was 11 or 12 years, 12 years old. And so I turn on the radio and what comes on but Ted Nugent Stranglehold. And I'm like, yeah, this kind of works. <laughs> I know that's just a story of the beginning 
of how the, the next chapter, kind of the little Viper family comes together. And I don't really consider myself a car collector. I'm not trying to be a collector or hoarder, but it's kind of comes that way. But there's something really neat of having like two of the absolute most iconic American cars of the modern era. There's a throwback to another time and it sort of reflects so much that I resonate with as a car person. And the thing about it is the, the blue car that I've had, um, I love the car. It was the car that I think was most synonymous with my personality and most miles I enjoyed the most. And it got wrecked and it went away and I thought that chapter was over. And then it got bought from insurance and the guy started fixing it and then I was able to buy it back cheap from him and fix it up the rest of the way. So I had this story where it was kind of like the bird flew away but came back, it was meant to be, you know. And now the Red Viper kind of has the same story. I was working when I had more modest means, just trying to sell classic cars and bought this car to resell and the people that bought it ended up becoming friends with them and then later it came back much the same way. So there is the beginning story to another amazing chapter of Casey and the Dodge Vipers. We go, okay, we're gonna do a 60 to 150. And they're like, well, it would really be better in a 100 to 200 race. It already takes a certain type of person to have a, to buy a Viper. It then takes another type of person to modify that Viper. Imagine the type of person it takes to build a business modifying those Vipers, right? Imagine that personality. The Calvo Motorsports Viper <laughs> is really the rolling reflection of Antonio Calvo's personality. The guy is extremely extroverted, loud, funny, flashy, and it's all about more, 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 more. It's the most Texas car ever, right? Every time you go to Texas, it's always the same thing, right? Thousand horsepower, stock brakes. <laughs> That's the most, it's the most Texas that it gets, right? He's got sli slicks on the back, stock wheels on the front, four-figure horsepower, stock brakes. That's, that's a Texas build, right? Fortunately, these guys started with an ACR. So uh, downforce, brakes, you know, the fastest car Chrysler's ever made. So you're starting with that. They then built the motor, starts as an 8.4 liter. They stroke it to nine liters and they add twin 76 millimeter turbochargers. So depending on what map and what fuel and what day, you know, you're talking about anywhere from 1100 at the wheels to 2000 horsepower at the wheels, which is an absolutely unfathomable uh, number. I mean, you tell someone something has 2000 horsepower and they go, I don't even comprehend that. What what is that? What does that even mean? You, it's got two thousand horsepower and a license plate. It's got two thousand horsepower and you and you just drove it here. Like what do you what do you mean? It, for for these guys, there will never be enough things to brag about. It's always about being the fastest, the craziest, refusing to really believe. And then anytime something else got close, there was always kind of an excuse. You know what I mean? Oh well, if we were running four less PSI on the tires. Oh, well, we were running map three, if it was map six, and um, yeah. Oh, well, it's, uh, it's uh, the ambient temperature is 92, and you know, meanwhile, okay. Having said that, holy mother of God. <laughs> they weren't wrong. <laughs> they, they may have had some dodgy excuses, but they weren't wrong. And the car was bananas, and the numbers that they were taught, oh, it does, a, it does a 240 standing half mile. It do, you know what I mean? It's like, it, not, the lap times at Circuit of the Americas are like, you know, Le Mans cars, <laughs> you know, like whatever. I've never in my life been in any thing that pushed on my chest with the force of that Viper in fourth gear. The Viper, we're talking about a rear wheel drive car that does 100 to 150 in 2.83 seconds. It, it recorded uh, yesterday the, the fastest 60 to 150 I've ever personally seen. It did a 5.05. 5.05, 60 to 150. And to do that in the Viper, you start in second. So it doesn't hook up until fourth. 5.05, 60 to 150, but 2.8 of that is 100 to 150. So you spin them for three seconds till you get to 100, put it in fourth, and floor it, and the needle goes 
and you're, <laughs> and you're at 100. I, I've never in my life felt anything like that. Now, Sissio pulled out a data log from his phone. He's got some GTR runway car that does it in four, four something, four seven or four five. But it's, 20, it's 2,200 horsepower, so whatever. You're talking about rear wheel drive, nine liters, twin snails, and a sequential box with downforce. 1,200 pounds of downforce at 150 miles an hour. The front end lifts because the wing is so gnarly. And it just doesn't grip at all. It's, it's, it's got a very advanced motorsport-based traction control system. So it will keep accelerating, but it'll be like, but, 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 you know, it'll be, but it'll go. But then just fourth, I've never felt anything like it, ever. The force on your chest is proportional to the throttle. So as, you, it's just, you know what I mean? Like it, it's, it's an, un, it's, I've never felt anything like it. The force was so heavy and the straightaway disappeared so fast. I mean, it, you came out of the corner, wound out third kinda, put it in fourth, went, and you're at the end of the straightaway. In the 60 to 160, they had to turn the boost down. What happens with cars like this is they, they can't hook up. First, second, third gear, they don't hook up. So they, they want to do roll races from 100 miles an hour. That's, that's what they want. We go, okay, we're going to do a 60 to 150. And they're like, well, it would really be better in a 100 to 200 race. Well, well would it? What a practical build you have there. How many people are you gonna get to find you to roll race you starting from 100? <laughs> like, what, like, what is the point of this thing exactly? They'll talk about tracks like they're at them. They're not. They're on the 130, two o'clock in the morning. I, go look them up on YouTube. Look up Calvo Motorsports Viper on YouTube. How many videos are you gonna see from tracks and how many videos are you gonna see from highways? If that's what you can get for writing a $250,000 check, not that that isn't a lot of money, it is. But that is an, it is a, a, an experience unavailable at any price from anywhere else. And that's, that's what you're buying. But when I got to Florida and I saw it there and I was like, I'm gonna get to have a go in that. The problem it had in the East Coast Regional, they brought it out and it had triple fuel pumps. And they told us if, if the thing gets to a quarter tank, get out, stay out of the boost because it will slosh the fuel rearward in the tank and the pickups are in the front and you'll, you'll run and drive. I guess we got kind of close to that during the street drives because one of the fuel pumps of the three took a poo. Uh, we felt bad, we thought we did it. It turns out, I think it was on its way out anyway. So what they did in between was update it to a new single better fuel pump. Didn't improve the fuel economy, but you didn't have to worry about running it dry anymore which in that car is a real problem. I mean, that car is, again, I have never seen a four-wheeled vehicle go through fuel like that, ever. And the fact that it's E85 made it worse. You know, E85 is, I hate E85. E85 is like, it's such a nightmare. No one ever has enough. <laughs> you, go through, you go through it four times as fast as you go through gasoline and nobody ever brings enough. A pull, a gallon. A pull, a gallon. You wind out third and fourth gear, it's a gallon of gas. That was the other thing about Sorted. We made up these games. You know, you, you just make up games. And you have no idea, you know what I mean? It's not, like, it's not like we made up the games based on the capabilities of the cars. We made up the games based on what we wanted to see them do. And to us, 10 laps of a racetrack is not that big of a deal, but a, a lot of the cars we had out there, uh, Tanner referred to as one pull wonders. You know, you, you it, it made all the power for the one pull and either it just got heat soaked or it, it did, you know, it did something else that it and, it, and a lot of the cars couldn't really make it more than two or three flying laps, which is a problem <laughs> for sports cars. Now, I, it should be said that the cars that made it to the final, for the most part, could, even with enormous horsepower. set of makeshift ramps out of rocks, bricks, and wooden planks. I can't even call them two by fours because they're not.
So April 2017, I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina for a race, and I get a Facebook message from a gentleman in Las Vegas who is interested in buying a Gen 5 Viper. He is a racing instructor at a performance driving school in Las Vegas. He's very familiar with exotic cars, and he's very particular in wanting something that is not only unique, but something that will appreciate in value. So we settled on a Striker Green 2014 GTS. There were 44 examples of the car made, and they had become increasingly harder to find. I start looking for the car, and he calls me and says, hey, I actually found the car, and I brokered the deal. All I need you to help me with is financing it, and I really want to bring it into your dealership and have you guys check it out. I value your opinion and I trust you. And I said, that's not a problem. I get to make a little bit of money and I get to help this gentleman out. I said, where's the car? He said, it's in Ontario, Canada. I said, okay, can you connect me with the gentleman who owns it? He said, that's not a problem. Like I said, everything's already done down to price. I said, wow, that makes my life really easy. This is probably going to be the simplest deal I've ever done. So I get in a three-way phone call with the gentleman buying the car in Las Vegas, myself and the gentleman selling the car in Ontario, Canada. He says that he owns a company that produces large farm equipment and he exports it to the United States all the time. So he would help handle all of the import export and I go ahead and I send the paperwork out to the gentleman in Las Vegas. He overnights it back, signed. He is the proud new owner of a Striker Green 2014 Viper GTS. So this is kind of where things start to unravel. I say, hey, go ahead and send me your wire transfer information. I will have my accountant wire you the funds in full tomorrow. And he was happy to do so. Finally, I get a phone call and it's his number and I'm like, okay, awesome, great. The process is rolling. He got the money. He waited a couple extra days for it to clear, especially since it's international wire. You know, maybe there was a hold somewhere. Okay, you know, great, we're, we're ready to rock. And he is on the phone and he is livid. And this is a demeanor I've never seen from this gentleman before because to this point, he's been casual, cool, calm, collected, and just awesome to work with. And he says, hey, it's been two or three days and I haven't seen my money. I said, hmm, that's interesting. My accountant confirmed that we sent it a few days ago, but let me check with her. So I go to my accountant and she said, okay, well, I'll look into it, but the money does show to be back in our account. Maybe there was a hang up and I'll go ahead and re resend it today. So I call him back and I said, hey, the money did come back to our account. You are correct. This is on a Friday afternoon, so I don't expect an international wire or a wire in general to clear until Monday or Tuesday. So I avoid it for the weekend and I await his phone call. So middle of the week, the following week, I get another phone call from him and he said, hey man, time number two, you know, dealing with you and I don't have my money. I go back to my account and I said, hey, we sent this money together last week. I saw it go out, you saw it go out. We reconfirmed his wire instructions and his account numbers with him on the phone before doing this to make sure that everything went through. And, and she said, yeah, she said, but I, look at this. The wire wasn't declined for some strange reason. It was actually accepted and then sent back. I called him back and I said, hey, listen, I understand you're frustrated, but looking at everything that we can see on our end, we actually saw that the money left our account, hit your account, cleared your account, and then was sent back to us. And he said, no, 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 that's not right. My accountant is my secretary for this company and she does this all the time and there's no reason that this should have happened and I'm getting extremely frustrated. If we can't get this right, then I'm pulling the deal. I said, hey, let's just make this really simple. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to put a check for the full amount in an envelope and I'm gonna get this out to you, you know, overnight, paid, expedited, whatever. And he said, okay, cool, that works. The money has cleared his account and he calls me and says, okay, when and where are you meeting this car? And I said, okay, well, going through the export process, you know, what port is closest to you? What have you done paperwork wise that you can send me so that I can get everything prepared so that when this car comes across, we don't have any hiccups. I know that your time is valuable and I know that my shipper's time is valuable and I wanna make sure that this goes as smoothly as possible. And he said, you know what, honestly, exporting this car isn't my deal. It's not my issue. It's not something that I should be responsible for. And I said, well, based on the structure of this deal and everything that you conveyed to us and to the gentleman purchasing the car out of Las Vegas, you are going to handle this because it's something your company handles on a regular basis. 
exporting from another country typically takes 30 days to get the paperwork together. You have to find a great registered importer to put it all together. These cars also suffered from two major recalls and you have to have all the recalls cleared before the car can leave the country. You know, what can we do to expedite this? Because this is gonna take 30 days. And he says, okay, well, I think that I have a way of, you know, I can get the car to the border. You need to send a transport. We're gonna use this port of entry on this day at this time. And I say, okay, great, cool, awesome. I don't wanna know, just get it done. Recall wise, I can handle it at my store. And, you know, we just accelerate things from where they are. So he shows up to the border, stays in a hotel, drove the car unbeknownst to us and added miles, which was also something that we had agreed would not happen. And my transporter makes the drive from Atlanta, Georgia, all the way up to Buffalo, New York. The gentleman says, okay, well, your transporter has to come across the border and grab this car. And I said, okay, do you have the paperwork ready? He said, no, I just said I would bring it to the border. Well, that's, that's definitely not what we discussed. That's definitely not what you said. You were gonna handle something and expedite this process and bring it across to us put it in the transport and get it out of here. He said, okay, well, this process is just all too convoluted and too complicated for me. I'm honestly sick of dealing with it and I am going to drive the car home now. So now I'm out a considerable amount of money on this transporter and I have roughly another thousand miles being accrued on this car from a round trip. And he calls me about five hours later and says, I am standing in front of a public storage unit and I am dropping the keys off at the front desk and I am leaving. This car is yours, it's your problem. I have my money, I'm paid, have a nice day. I'm on the phone with the storage unit and I say, hey, is the storage unit covered? Is it climate controlled? Is it locked? Is it secured? Do you have security cameras? This is a very expensive car, it's a very rare car. We need to make sure it's safe. Does the storage unit have a lip on it? Can we make sure that we don't scrape the car, pulling it in, pulling it out? But then the bad news of, well, our storage unit, you know, it is covered, it is climate controlled, it does lock, you know, we can provide the lock, but it's raised a couple feet off the ground because of where we are in the snow and everything like that. So they constructed a set of makeshift ramps out of rocks, bricks, and wooden planks. I can't even call them two by fours because they're not. And they were able to very carefully get the car into the storage unit. Dukes have hazard their way out the window. We get the car transported from the storage unit and taken to a Chrysler dealer right across from the port of entry, which that couldn't have worked out any better than it did. And once everything gets finalized, the car came across. We had our transporter go back up, pick the car up and bring it to us. At this point, the customer has been paying on this car for six months. As we started this process in April, it's now late October and he no longer wants the car and I don't blame him. We reimburse him for the six months of payments that he made. We help him find another car. He's a happy customer, understood that the whole situation was out of our control. Now I have a Canadian car in kilometers sitting in my showroom. I can't add extended warranty to it. It's just a very difficult sale for us. And at the time that this car arrived, I was able to secure a pre-owned 2017 limited edition snakeskin green Viper and bring it into our inventory. And the gentleman who came out of that car was in the market for a striker green. He didn't like the way that the snakeskin presented in person versus pictures that he had seen. So I told him, hey, we can make this process a lot simpler than me just purchasing your car. I can sell you this awesome striker green car that I just you know, bought. It is a Canadian car. I can't add warranty to it, but it's in fantastic condition, low miles. It's one of the most pristine, well-kept Vipers I've ever seen. And we were able to make that transaction happen. And I wound up getting a really rare, fantastic car on trade that far exceeded what the Striker Green car was. And so crisis averted, we wound up just a great win-win situation. Can't help but notice, but the car does not have that motor anymore. And he says, yes, I blew it up. So if you remember, I, I traded this SLC for two cars. 
And what I got in trade was I got a Gen 2 1997 Dodge Viper race car. I loved Vipers since I was a little kid and I had, it was my poster car. I had one. So when I was offered in trade for this, I said, heck yeah, I want a Gen 2 race car Viper. That's awesome. It was built by Autoform, uh, which is a pretty popular uh, Viper transformation company that makes a lot of parts for Vipers. And the guy who used to own it worked for Dodge. Cool, huh? And it's got a crate motor with a thousand miles on it. I said, okay, sure, fine. Uh, so, and he, and he goes, don't worry, you hit a tire barrier, it's totally buffed out, no problem. So we get there and I'm trading my SLC for this uh, Viper and a 1979 uh, Porsche 911. And I look at the Viper and it is dirty inside and out. There are cracks on every fender. The uh, tire barrier where he said it had hit, um, where he said, oh, it'll buff out, had actually been painted over red to try and paint it over. In reality, it was just black marks with red paint over it. It was a giant disaster and it was horrible. And it had this you know, cage that was in there. It smelled terrible. Um, it, race car, it, it smelled of fuel. There was no interior, no nothing that, that went with it. But I knew it was a well-sorted race car because it had run at a bunch of races and it came with an S, its own SCCA logbook and had done quite well. So I was like, all right, cool. I'm gonna you know, take this to some of the local uh, autocrosses and have a great time with it. And uh, I, I get it home and I start kind of sorting it out a little bit. I end up taking out the roll cage because if I'm gonna make this into a street car, I, roll cages can be kind of dangerous. So I chose to take out the, the roll cage and buy a, a, a interior pieces for it and put it back, the interior anyway, that way. Found the guy who had owned it prior to the guy I got it from. Sure enough, he's from Detroit. He uh, worked with Dodge and a bunch of other things and come to find out it's an original hot dog car. It is, um, if you remember back in the 90s, Hulk Hogan had one. It was all red with yellow stripes and yellow wheels. And this guy I called still had the wheels, the original yellow wheels, which I'm sure everybody can imagine are in super high demand. They're not. And he said, I have all the original interior pieces as well. I got the original airbags, I've got the seats, I've got door panels, I've got all the original interior that we gutted and made this into a race car. I said, that's great. What do you want? He says, a thousand bucks. I said, where do you want to meet? I met with this guy and he was actually a really cool guy. He said, look, story of the car is, I bought it uh, from somebody who had gone bankrupt and needed money, so I bought it, turned it into a race car. I worked with Dodge on a number of different projects and I had designed some of their heads and I designed this motor and it made, a, in the 90s, uh, early 2000s, made a thousand horsepower, naturally aspirated road race car. I said, wow, that's impressive. I go, I can't help but notice, but the car does not have that motor anymore. And he says, yes, I blew it up. Okay. And he goes, what happened was, is since I had a bunch of friends at Dodge, I chose to buy a crate motor, stick it in, and then immediately sell it and be done with it for the rest of my life. So, okay, cool. So I choose to put this thing back and I'm looking at it and the interior's in better shape. The car runs well, because it's a crate motor, no miles on it. And so I choose to put some big bear brakes on it and some forge line wheels. And I look at the exterior and I'm like, this is crap. This thing is just disgusting. So I, as my very first wrapping endeavor, choose to wrap the Viper myself. And I'm watching a bunch of tutorials on YouTube and seeing what thing people do for wraps and stuff like that because the paint was crap anyway, who cares? Like, you know, they're like, oh, well, you gotta make sure the paint doesn't come up if you wrap it. I'm like, what did I care? I don't care. So this will be fun, this will be a, a thing. And universally, I kid you not, there was a line somewhere in almost every tutorial that says, don't worry, wrapping should be very straightforward unless you're wrapping a Viper. Why would you want to do that? And I'm going, it's like wrapping a basketball. If you've ever bought a basketball for somebody at Christmas and then tried to wrap it, it's, that's exactly what it's like. I don't know what the hell I was thinking because that was not the ideal first time to try and wrap or learn to wrap something because there's a skill and there's an art to it. And I don't, I think I did okay at the end, 
because um, there's no flat surfaces on a Gen 2 Viper, none. It, it is round, and I decided the first thing to wrap was the hood. And if you are uh, unfamiliar with a Gen 2 Viper hood, it is uh, the size of Nebraska and um, has, the, has the, the general shape of an oval. It took me eight hours to do this. Two huge sheets to do it. And, uh, and I still don't think it turned out super great, but uh, I did it in matte black and it was, uh, I, I nicknamed it the War Venom. I, like, I love nicknaming my cars with something fun and clever and somewhat humorous. And uh, this one I just called War Venom. So I wrap this Viper, I take it to my race, and this is when I got second place at that uh, event. And that really pissed me off because I did really well and the car broke. And I ended up losing on a technicality. You had to do a horsepower race, uh, an autocross time, and a stop box time. I annihilated the stop box time, did great in the autocross. And the guy who eventually won, because I got second, beat me by six horsepower at the dyno. And that's how he won. And I was pissed. I annihilated the stop box. I mean, I have won that stop box four or five years in a row. That's my event, let me tell you. I was so mad about this. That's when I decided I'm, I'm gonna upgrade the heads. I'm gonna do all this work. I'm gonna, I sent it out uh, to some friends uh, over at TPIS in Chaska who do a lot of engine work and, uh, you know, the heads are like this big. I mean, V10 heads, right? And I always used to, to uh, joke with people. I said, well, you know, Dodge worked with Lamborghini to design this motor, so therefore I own a Lamborghini. I mean, that's, that's the logic, right? It's a V10, of course, right? And uh, the, the intake manifold is like 800 pounds and it's, you know, the bolts are buried in there. It's just a mess to get to. And I ended up doing it. And before I even got the chance to go race it again, I sold it. I, I put it online. Some bank executive guy, whatever, uh, wired, saw it for sale, wired me the money and picked it up like a week later. And uh, he said, um, he sent me a picture on the New Jersey side uh, of the river where the towers would would have would have stood. There's a monument there, and I thought that was really cool. I was like, "Wow, that's that's a really cool picture of my car next to the 911 monument on the New York, New Jersey side." And I said, "How do you get that picture?" He goes, "That's where I live." I said, "I can't imagine what your rent must be to have a car in New Jersey on the river facing the towers. Like, holy cow, dude!" And he goes, "Yeah, I'm gonna take it on a rally." Fine, aim my car. You know, I have very little emotional attachment to cars. Cars are tools, they're for fun, you know. I have a long list of cars I wanna own in my life and I'm just kinda working my way through it at this time. Hence the joke, I go through cars faster than I go through wives, which is fine. And he periodically sends me some pictures and he goes on this rally and he sends me a picture of, you know, a, a stack of ones, which, God knows what that was for. Uh, some radios and a picture of a gun and a bunch of other things. And I'm just, I, you know, like, hey, that's your scene, man. That's not my scene, but fine, whatever. And then he, takes me, he sends me a picture of this. And by, oh, by the way, man, I got this Instagram model to come with me and ride shotgun. And okay, cool. Like, I, I don't care. I did care when he sent me a picture and I didn't save it. And I'm kicking myself for this because I think I was just so, dis I was just, I was, I was more kind of offended by it more than anything when he sent me a picture of him standing on the roof, not the hood, but the roof of the Viper. It's, it's a fiberglass car. The whole thing's fiberglass. Top, sides, fenders, everything. In the middle of Times Square, this thing's all stickered up from the rally he was on. I don't even want to mention it. And he's standing on it in Times Square, standing on it, we know, like, woo, big victory sign. And it's kind of went, why did you have to do that? Like, I don't have an emotional attachment to it, but come on, man, that's a Gen 2 Viper you've got there, come on. And the ending of that story is he ended up blowing up the transmission doing 160 miles an hour down the highway and emailed me and said, you know, what did you sell me? And I said, I don't know, doing 160 miles an hour, 160 mile an hour pulls on the highway is, um, sounds like your fault. That is not possible. That is not going to happen.
I maintained a pretty good presence on the Dodge Viper forums. I uh, liked to stay up to date with what was going on, but the dealership made the decision not to pay to sponsor the forums. And in order for me to advertise, I had to be a paying sponsor. So I played quietly and would comment on posts without crossing the line of, of advertising for myself or my dealership as an unpaid sponsor. So I tried to lend assistance in answering questions technically based about the platform as best I could. One day, a gentleman on the forum posed a question and said, I am in the market for my first Viper. I really want a Gen 5 and I really want to work with someone who has good knowledge base on the car. Who should I buy from? This started what would be my absolute worst day selling cars. I am very humbled to have great clientele who posted that they should buy from me and posted my contact information. And it wasn't one or two, but several. I jumped on the forum and I made a comment in response to those posts and I said, hey, I appreciate the referral, the recommendation, uh, and I'd be happy to work with you going forward. I found myself banned from not just that Viper forum, but every Viper forum on Facebook and the regular internet forums within five minutes of making that comment. I was also sent a screenshot from a very good friend of mine in the Viper community a couple minutes following that and that one of my biggest competitors uh, in Viper sales as a dealer had made a post or made a comment on that same string discrediting me and my knowledge base of the platform and my ability to sell. It was a pretty low thing to do. I was racking my brain thinking, am I going to be able to ever kind of claw my way back from this. I can't comment and rebut what's been said. It's extremely false, but I have no way of putting it out there. As my day is just unraveling at the seams quickly, I get a phone call. The gentleman introduces himself as a very large member of the Viper community in Minnesota. And he saw the whole situation transpire said that he had been following me for quite some time and that he was interested in buying a Viper and that he was actually dealing with the dealership that publicly humiliated you. And I didn't think that that was right. And I wanted to get a little bit more information from you before I made a purchasing decision. And I said, I appreciate you giving me that opportunity. He says, well, let me discuss something interesting with you. I'm not just looking to purchase one. I'm looking to purchase seven. I am the president of the Viper Club of Minnesota. And so I have six other gentlemen plus myself and we all want to order ACR Extremes. This is 2016 that this is happening when the ACR had just been released. He said, we, we want to order them from the same dealership. We want to make sure that they get ordered at the same time. One of the biggest hurdles that we have is we want to pick them up from the factory. I said, I don't think that that would be a problem considering it's something that we offer but I need to make sure. In the nature of a group deal, he obviously wanted a bit of a discount, which I was happy to oblige. But part of the premise of this order was that all seven of these cars had to be picked up at the factory at the same time. I wanted to ensure that I could offer him what he was asking for. So I have a good friend who is the program manager at GTC, which is the one of one Viper ordering program that we were going to order these cars through. I made a phone call to him and I said, these guys want to order seven Vipers and they want to pick them up on the same day at the same time and they want to take the tour and they want to have the experience. And he said emphatically, no, that is not possible. That is not going to happen. We don't have enough room in our facility in order to place the cars and do the delivery. And I can't guarantee that when we're going through the order process, I can give consecutive VIN numbers. There's no guarantee that they'll finish at the same time. There's no guarantee that they'll start at the same time. Uh, so logistically, it's impossible. We can't sit on a car for six months that's complete while the other one is beginning its build process. I said, I understand, but unfortunately, I can't make this deal happen if you can't help me. The Light bulbs went off, the wheels started turning. I called the gentleman back who said that he wanted to place the group order. And I said, sure, we can do it. Chrysler said that they'll 100% get on board with you. 
And he said, well, I can't believe it. That's awesome. Because the dealership that I was dealing with, which is the one that kind of threw some shade your way on the internet, so to speak, said that it could not be done. There was no way. And, and that's part of the reason that we reached out. And I said, oh, well, I I don't know why it's that big of a deal. I called and they said that it was probably, you know, the easiest thing, that the easiest question they fielded all day. I needed to get all of the guys on the phone, collect all their information, get all of the order information and place them in the system and kind of get the ball rolling, so to speak. He says, okay, that's not a problem. We hang up the phone. 30 seconds later, my phone rings again, another Minnesota area code. I answer the phone and it's the first gentleman placing his order. Uh, this process repeated itself for the next three or four hours. We got to the point where we were about to place the orders and I wanted to call Chrysler again, call my, my contact at Viper Concierge and, and have one more final conversation with him. And I said, hey, listen, I uh, remember that phone call that we had earlier where you said it couldn't be done, I shouldn't take those orders and you know that'd be the end of it. Well, I took the orders. What can we do? It had never been done before, which was the big hurdle for us. The next couple of weeks were pretty creative. The difficulty that we ran into with this group order was that a handful of guys wanted custom colors, but a handful of guys were okay with factory colors. So if I input the orders collectively at the same time, unfortunately, some would start production far sooner than others. The other issue that we run into with the custom colors is Chrysler doesn't always get them right. They send out a little model car in that color to me first at the dealership to approve. And then if I approve, I mail that color sample to the customer for approval. So once the color arrives to me, if it's so far off, I choose not to send it to the customer. I call Viper Concierge back. I let them know that the color is off. We go back to the drawing board and we do this again. We're given three opportunities to get the color right before we start getting charged. So it's imperative that we get this right the first time. We had a issue with the gentleman who was ringleading the group order in that he wanted a very exclusive color that he had on his Lamborghini Gallardo, Verde Ithaca. A gorgeous color, but a very difficult tri-coat to match. We had our first round of paint samples come out and they sent us Verde Mantis. We sent the paint sample off. I called him and let him know it's not quite exactly what we wanted. It starts with a Verde, but doesn't end with an Ithaca. Take a look and let me know if it's something you're interested in. And he didn't like it. We didn't send that paint sample back, needless to say. They didn't necessarily lighten it. Instead, they darkened it. I sent it out to him and I said, hey, we're really having a hard time. And we got one other opportunity to get the color right. I said, hey, what other options do you have in terms of color? You know, green isn't gonna work. He said, well, the only other color that I would really accept is striker purple, which is one of our factory colors. It's an $8,900 color option. All the other color samples had come back, everything was approved, we're good to make this order happen. So we place the order for these cars on the same time at the same day in order to ensure that they have consecutive VIN numbers and they run together. This was about a year build on all of these cars at this point. The cars start getting split up and we start entering different statuses at different times, which is a little unnerving. So I'm making my phone calls to Chrysler on a daily basis for a year to hold this all together. Please hold the completed cars in the factory. Please don't ship these out. Please don't accidentally send them to you know the dealer. When we got close to the point of completion on all of the cars, I started getting some phone calls from the Minnesota Viper Owners Association and, and the Viper Club of Minnesota wanting to do a piece on the car. And that piece from the Viper Owners Association turned into getting contacted by DuPont Registry. Unfortunately, one of the gentlemen had a family emergency and backed out of his order. We were able to keep the other six on track and we were going to take the seventh and roll it into our inventory, which I was ecstatic about because build allocation was very limited on these cars. This has turned into the largest group order and factory pickup in Chrysler history. They took the room that they typically did the deliveries in, which is designed for one Viper, and were able to fit three under car cover and deliver those early in the day while the other three took their tour at the factory. The second group at that point, who had taken delivery earlier on in the day, then did their factory tour. They got together, uh, did a fantastic photo shoot. So at the end of the day, all six of these cars get delivered what started as my absolute worst day in the car industry where I didn't know where I was going to turn after my debacle on the internet wound up becoming my absolute best day in the car industry and became the largest factory delivery and group order of Dodge Vipers in Chrysler history.
It's a bulging supercar in a small town. There was a friend of mine who uh, left our small town and went all the way to California, became a videographer for Discovery and whatnot. And he would be the crazy guy shooting like world's deadliest catch. And then anyway, he goes, Casey, man, we gotta do a sizzle about you or something like, who knows, you're, you're crazy enough, we gotta do a show. I'm like, all right, let's take the race car. And at the time I had a chassis built by Bob McKee for the early USRRC series, which was the predecessor to Can-Am. And in about 1970, 71, it was bodied with a Lola T70 Mark III B body. So basically, you know, a European endurance race or something you'd see in the movie Le Mans, that sort of thing. It was basically my entire net worth in my <laughs> late 20s, right? So I told him, let's, uh, let's take it. I'll find a track day. We'd go to Nelson Ledges, this tiny little track up in Akron, Ohio, and just to do some video. And of course, I'm the only goofball showing up in a Can-Am car, basically. Period correct looking clothing, open face helmet, goggles and everything. And I see this blue with white stripes, 97 Viper GTS sitting there with a wing on. I'm like, I gotta check this out. It was just cool. I mean, anything built by Bob Lutz, testosterone machine is probably something I'm gonna wanna drive. And uh, I said to the man who had it, was going to the track day, I said, sir, I'm interested in buying one of these cars. Do you mind if I just look inside your car? And he goes, sure, actually, hell, you got a fast car. You can drive it if you want. I'm like, really, on the track? Okay, next session? Yeah, all right. And my dad was with me, and as many dads are, he's like, are you crazy? I'm like, dad, I, well, I'm, I'm here in a cool car. I, I can afford to buy it, why not? You know, <laughs> let's test drive it. And I had no idea how to work the head unit, the radio. It was one of those that flip up, and the reason that matters is we're pulling out of the pits to go on the track in this car I've never been in that's fast with my dad, who's being a dad. It was blasting like speed, ma speed metal, like da -da 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 the whole time. It was like Power Man 5000 or something like this, like full stereo. Your hair is tingling. It's so loud. My dad's like, turn that crap off. And I'm like, I know, man. And I pushed buttons and the uh, head unit just folds up. And I'm like, I, I, I don't know how to use this, dad. We got to just go. He's like, but this is crap. And I'm like, just go with it, man. And I just fell in love immediately. That big blue bulging hood and those beautiful mirrors. And it made my dad bothered. So it was probably pretty cool. And I talked to the man, he goes, actually, I was thinking about maybe selling it. So later I called him on the phone, we arranged a deal. It was a very nice price. I'm like, I gotta get there and buy this quick before he changes his mind. And I lived in a small town and this man lived about two and a half hours away and I had to find a buddy who could drive the car home. Nobody was available. And so I called this girl <laughs> who was interested. I'm like, um, you wanna go with me out of town to buy a car? I need somebody to drive it back. We'll have a fun, make a day thing out of it. And as oftentimes you're surprised by people who own supercars, it's very interesting to see where they live. And she's like, oh, it's just down here, the driveway. And we're on this driveway, and on this driveway, and on this driveway, and it goes and goes and goes past horses and manicures, very beautiful. And you get to a very beautiful house with a turnaround, American flag out, and I remember it was a sunset, and there's the Viper just sitting there looking glorious. But the thing that was so interesting about this Viper is, as a 20-something single guy, I realized this car over a lot of other exotic cars seems to have an effect on this single woman. Hmm, I really like this and I'm gonna go with this. And soon after the car earned the nickname Goose because I said it was the best wingman ever and it had absolutely nothing to do with flying. And at the time I lived in a very small Midwestern town, 18,000 people. There's some industrial, a lot of farming, that sort of thing. And our family business was a small golf course out of town. And every day I'd drive to the golf course. And the course being out in the middle of the country, you know there's not a lot of patrolmen out there, and being a race driver, I, uh, I would use my car and really enjoy it. I would drive out to the golf course every day, have a great time. There's a hot rod shop out there. I knew I could blaze by there in like fourth gear, and then there was, used to be a railroad track, so I slow down. You just crest the hill without catching air. And there's a stop sign, this beautiful road between fields. There's nobody around, and you could accelerate full throttle like first, second, third gear, right into fourth, and you'd be flat out, and you could just get to that corner without lifting. And of course, you're on and sailing by. And then eventually, a little bit, you start seeing a few residential houses. So you bring it back down to a reasonable speed. And then there was this uh, left-hand turn, which is kind of a third gear sweeper. So, you know, whoom, whoom, third gear, flat out, back down this hill, back up to fourth, fifth, down to first, and then blast it back up to the golf course. You know, I grew up driving like that, and that's probably how it helped become a race car driver. But there's a problem with this that I didn't realize as a 20-something-year-old kid. It's not gonna take long before everybody knows who you are and everybody knows your driving habits. And it didn't help matters that on that third gear corner, there was a very crusty old man that lived there. And that on the other street where I would slow down just a little bit for the crest of the hill, my ex-girlfriend mother, who hated my guts, I don't know why, because it was very nice to her, 
What happened was the hot rod guys started seeing sheriffs sitting on the road and they're like, um, you guys never patrol out here. Is there something we should know about? Well, uh, probably my ex-girlfriend's mother made such a fuss about it that it became a thing in a small town where it basically was the Dukes of Hazard, and it became a Roscoe P. Coltrane's got a bet with the city cops to who can now nail the flashy race car driver and Viper first. And it hit me within about three hours. Yeah, I'm done. I'm done with this town. I, I can't be me here anymore. I'm not going to be able to work on race cars and flashy cars if this is the way it is. Because this isn't like the 70s and 80s. I can't go sliding a Dodge Charger sideways and have fun with the good old boys. I made a deal to move out of town to uh, work with this guy with his race shop and do some fun stuff. And a week later, I, I mean, it was a very short time, I ended up moving out of town and, and starting things that way. When I moved out of town to Columbus, Ohio, it had a really good exotic car scene. The cars and coffee there. I love the environment. I love being around the people. It just, the horizon was much bigger and better. But at the same time too, I was young and cocky and which probably didn't work in my favor, but made things a lot of fun sometimes. We would go on all these great exotic car drives to the countryside and power into numbers, you know, you're fast and it was fun. And I remember this time we got lost in the middle of the country, totally turned around. Now there's all these supercars, just like, just, it looked like Austin Powers trying to turn around and they're going up this gravel hill. And another friend of mine, Joe, in a Porsche comes there to turn around. And I kind of had this little thing, which was very immature of me at the time. I was in my 20s, give me a break. With this guy who, he was pretty cool. Uh, he was a CEO. He really got into Ferraris and Lamborghinis. But to me and my kind of friends that built stuff, he was sort of like the rich kid of the group in high school that's not really that cool and not that good at riding BMX bikes, but he hangs out anybody, but you kind of want to mess with him, you know? And I remember he was behind me in some Ferrari. And uh, I'm like, all right, let's see if you can do this. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, flip into kart racing mode. And I hadn't done this in the Viper, but my brain just told me I could. We need to turn around and go this way, and I've got a short area. So I'm like, I'm just going to light him up, light up the tires, get the coefficient, twitch it this way, that way, and spin it around and go back, no problem. Well, it actually worked, and it was a, it was a beautiful thing. It did it exactly how it worked in my mind, which that's not always how life works, but in this case it did, and I was thankful. And I remember accelerating by him in the Ferrari, and just for a moment, I was like, mmm, wah, like this. And uh, that was me in my 20s. <laughs> but the Viper was a fantastic car. It was reliable. I just enjoyed putting miles and miles and miles on it because it never broke. And I never felt bad about parking in a parking lot because it had a fiberglass body, and you wouldn't get door dings. And I remember in uh, 2013, it was December, there was no snow on the ground, there was no ice, and I took the Viper out to go meet with some friends. And I was driving back to my condo on Sawmill Drive, and it was a typical, you know, two lanes each way and a median, 45, 50 mile an hour. And I was just driving home, wasn't even doing anything interesting or going fast, and I see a car come blazing out from the other side across traffic. And I'm thinking, okay, you know, they probably see me coming and they just want to go southbound like me. I'm just going to move over a lane, let them have that lane. No. And this is all happening within quarters of a second. And so I, I just move over in the lane, maintain the speed, and I see the car count. I'm like, they're not stopping. I was mad because now I'm on the brakes as hard as I can. It is a Viper with ABS. It's December. Pirellis are not going to grab. And then the moment goes, I'm going to hit that car. And there's nothing I can do. And I'm like, I'm mad. And then I see that big, beautiful Viper hood I fell in love with on the racetrack go Whoa, like this. And it hit hard enough that it kind of, it felt weightless, but I didn't know if I was just like instantaneous adrenaline mad. And just pommeled the car and then slid and then hit the curb. And I'm sitting there, I'm fine. The airbags never went off because I put in a, a Nardi wheeling, so those were gone. And I had the presence of mind from working on cars for all those years. Okay, the car got wrecked in the front. Turn off the motor so nothing bad happens to the engine so you can fix it in the future. And I like turn off the car and I'm so mad. And I like get out, and this is a very busy street, five lanes, but I didn't care. I'm like a black leather jacket, sunglasses on. I just straight Terminator marched across the road because I hit this car so hard. It stopped all the forward momentum. It spun around like once or twice in oncoming traffic where other cars hit it. You know, this is my car. I worked to get this. I'm a kid from like the cornfields working on this and you just wrecked it. Like, and it's a Viper, so everybody's gonna think I screwed up. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Come on. So I remember walking up and this door opens and for a moment, I didn't feel bad, but like, I'm not gonna pick a fight because it was this not very athletic looking young woman in a not very athletic looking car. But I was so mad, it just took over and, and all that came out of my mouth was stupid. 
And so I turn around, and I, I, you know, come on, I'm a little embarrassed, but like the car just got wrecked. Give me a break. Everybody was fine. Nobody got hurt at all. But the car she ended up clipping over there was driven by a, 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 a young woman who's probably 16 years old that had her baby in the back seat and another woman over there. And I'm like, oh my God, could this be any more ridiculous? And everybody's gonna think I'm basically Satan because clearly it's my fault, even though I was doing the speed limit and avoid, you know, obeying all the laws and I have zero points on my license. And I'm standing over there and now the guy who lives a few doors down from me sees this. He's driving his Nissan GTR, so he's gonna come to Car Guy Rescue. And now suddenly other like exotic cars are coming by to see what's going on. And these people involved with the wreck and they all think I'm the devil because basically it's an exotic car and now there's a wreck. So a police officer does everything, comes up to me and says, sir, she was in a left-hand turn lane only. It w everything she did was illegal. Even if you were doing 200 miles an hour, it's still her fault you're fine. And I said, well, thank you, but I actually wasn't at <laughs> this time. The car was pretty smashed up. I mean, it's a Viper. There's other fish in the sea. Let insurance take it. I did well enough, had a good policy, and they went to bat for me on the other people, so everything was fine. And I got a call from a guy that had bought my wrecked Viper, and he was fixing it up because I had a sticker on it. He tracked me down. And he goes, I wondered if you had maybe had any parts for it. And I'm like, actually, I do. And so he bought some parts off of me. And he fixed it up, and I didn't pay attention to it. And he calls me back six months later and go, well, I fixed it, but I think I'm going to sell it. You want to buy it? And the price was right. And I went and looked at it, and it had a tick. I had some things to do. But my, my fiance at the time, my wife, was like, that car was your baby. Like, that was you. You need to just get it. And I did. And I spent a bunch of time fixing it up. And me rebuilding the car was therapeutic because I never want to get rid of it. I'm going to put a million miles on this thing. It's still a great car. It's still a total hooligan car, but it's very reliable. They say you can't keep a good man down and you can't keep a good car down. And so for me, my uh, favorite car forever, daily driver is my 97 Dodge Viper GTS.